passage this morning is from Psalm 22, verses 1 through 5. My God, my God, why have you forsaken me? Why are you so far from saving me from the words of my groaning? Oh my God, I cry by day, but you do not answer. And by night, but I find no rest. Yet you are holy, enthroned on the praises of Israel. In you our fathers trusted, they trusted, and you delivered them. To you they cried and were rescued. In you they trusted and were not put to shame. This is God's word for us today. You may be seated. Good morning. My name is Josh Hebman. I'm the executive pastor here at Grace. And as you can see on the slide here behind me, our service, our sermon this morning is entitled, See the Suffering Servant. We chose a lighthouse this week for the same reason that we chose a wave last week. Last week I said that we chose this image of a wave crashing over a pier because we wanted to give you that visual representation of what it might feel like if you are suffering in silence, being overwhelmed by the circumstances around you. And this morning we wanted to give you a different visual referent, one of hope, a lighthouse, something that you would point to, something that you would point yourself at where you would see a way forward because Jesus is our way forward. He is our suffering servant and Jesus is able to do what we cannot. And so we want to look to him today. We want to look at how he is able to do what we can't do. Uh, I had, uh, we asked Thad to read just the first five verses of Psalm 22 because this captures all of what we need to have captured this morning, both our struggle, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me, that feeling that we are completely alone, and also this idea that God is to be enthroned on the praises of Israel, that he is trustworthy because our fathers have trusted him in the past and he has delivered them. So Certainly, this is not the whole psalm. We are going to talk about more of the psalm today, but the reason we started with just these five verses is because this is where the tension exists. How can we feel, at, on one hand, at one time, as though God has forsaken us, and at the same time, know that he is faithful? How are we supposed to do that? Before we get there, I want to remind you what we talked about last week, which was that when you are suffering, it is so very important for you to share that you are suffering. God wants to hear from you, so you should cry out to him. And he has given us all each other. He has given us the body of Christ so that we are not alone, so that we have someone to go to, and not just someone, but many to go to, that we might have hope, that we might have encouragement, so that we can share with one another what God has done for us. So we talked about this last week. I said, stop suffering in silence. But it is true that maybe you have tried to share what's going on with you. Maybe you have shared what you are suffering with other people, and it went badly. It went poorly. You told people, here's how I'm suffering, and you were told, perhaps, that your suffering was not valid, or people just didn't listen. Or maybe you went to the church and you said, here's how I'm suffering, and you received condemnation or you received abuse. All of those things have happened. It's possible that you cried out and... David? Nope. Wait. Hold that thought. It's still working. It's, me. it's possible that you tried to cry out and it's just you didn't know what to do. right? You were so overwhelmed with your grief or with your fear or with your doubt, that you just couldn't make it happen. And then also it's possible that you've been told to just stop suffering. Last week I gave examples of ways in which we have been told uh, that our suffering is not valid. And uh, last, last Sunday evening when I preached downtown, somebody said, oh, you forgot an important one. I said, what about stop crying or I'll give you something to cry about? We have heard that. We have used that. And if that's the response that you receive from suffering, when you've cried out, when you've tried to share, here's what's going on, it's a, it's a bigger burden, right? You have not solved anything. So we've told you that you should cry out to God, and we've told you that you should share here in this congregation, and this is a place where you can receive healing, but it's possible that you've tried that, and it has not gone well. 
So that's why we're pointing to the suffering servant today, because even here, there is brokenness. Even here, where it's supposed to be a place where you come and receive healing, that doesn't always happen. And that's why we need Jesus. So what I want to point today through Psalm 22 to the suffering servant. Jesus, who comes to save us from sin, who comes to show us the way, and that the kingdom to come is waiting. It's ready. It's here. It's not yet, but it's here, and it's waiting for us. This is who Jesus is. This is what Jesus does. He shows us a better way than the way that we would choose for ourselves. Jesus comes to save us from sin. This is very important. This morning, we're going to talk about the fact that he is our Savior. And we're going to talk about him being our servant. And the reason that we need to know these things, that he saves us, that he serves us, is because we need to know him. You've heard perhaps many times that having a relationship with Jesus is more important than just having the religion of following Jesus. But what does that mean? What does it mean to have a relationship with Jesus? Well, you have to know who he is. To have a relationship with anybody, you have to know who he is. And we need to have a relationship with Jesus until we need to know who he is. And he is our savior. If we have not sinned, if we are all basically good people and just bad things happen to us, we don't do any bad things, then we don't need a savior. But Jesus says we do need a savior. And he is that savior. So it's good that we get to know him to find out what he means by that. He says that we need to be saved from sin, so let's see what he means by that. When he comes to show us the way, he's going to serve us. We need to know who he is as a servant. What does it mean that he comes to serve us? That's going to help us have a relationship with him. We need to know who he is. And he is our king. If we're going to have a true relationship with Jesus, we have to understand that he is not just a suffering servant. He is also our king. And that has implications for us even today. So pray with me, and let's look to the suffering servant. Holy God, I praise you for being a God who knows our needs so intimately because you have lived this life just as we have. Lord, most of us have suffered, but none of us here in this room have suffered unto death, and you have. Help us to see how that is important, how it is beneficial for us to have a God who doesn't just suffer, Lord, but gives himself completely for our sakes. I pray, Lord, that you would help us to know you better, have a real relationship with you today. Pray it in your name. Amen. So let's start here in Psalm 22, verse 1. Uh, You guys recognize these words, right? If you've been in a church ever, you've very likely heard these words because these are the words that Jesus cries out when he is on the cross. And we're going to see later in Matthew chapter 27 how Jesus says these words and what it means. But here, David is saying these words. David, who lives about a thousand years before Jesus walks the earth, David says these words. He says, My God, my God, why have you forsaken me? Why are you so far from saving me? From the words of my groaning. Oh my God, I cry by day, but you don't answer. And by night, but I find no rest. And we're not skipping uh, these verses here in the middle because they're not important. We're going to come to them in a minute. David goes on, But I am a worm and not a man, scorned by mankind, despised by the people. All who see me mock me. They make mouths at me. They wag their heads. He trusts in the Lord. Let him deliver him. Let him rescue him, for he delights in him. There's a lot of pronouns there, right? That's a little confusing. Verse 8, so let's talk about what David is saying in verse 8. David is saying, I am being mocked. The people around me, they are looking at me and they are mocking me. And they are saying about me, since God, uh, since he trusts in God, let God deliver him. Let God rescue him. For this man delights in God. So let's let God do the work that he says God does. And Jesus also receives this exact condemnation from the Pharisees. They see Jesus on the cross and they say, well, he says that he's God's son. Let God save him. We know, and we will hear next week, just how God restores, renews, remakes Jesus and us through him. But this week, we're talking about how Jesus, even Jesus, can say, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? 
It is a mystery. How can God say he feels forsaken by himself? How can God feel abandoned by himself? We don't know all the details, but we do know this, that Jesus cries out in this way because he knows that we also cry out in this way. And he comes to suffer on our behalf and to serve us. And so he does this. But he does this knowing that God is faithful. And we also know that God is faithful. We've seen him be faithful to his people in the past. We feel he is faithful in the present. And we need this reminder too, that he is holy. It says, Psalm 22, 3, you are holy and throned on the praises of Israel and you our fathers trusted. They trusted and you delivered them. To you they cried and were rescued. In you they trusted and were not put to shame. And David goes on, he says, you're the one who took me from the womb. God, you made me trust you at my mother's breast. On you I was cast from birth, and from my mother's womb you have been my God. So David knows this. David is speaking prophetically because it's the same Holy Spirit that gives David these words that ultimately gives Jesus strength. And so we see the same words here in Psalm 22, a thousand years before Jesus, that we hear in Jesus' words when he's on the cross. And It's both, my God, why have you forsaken me? And also, I know that you are faithful. And so here's what Jesus does that we can't do. And here's how he shows us the way. He suffers unto death and he experiences this pain, but he doesn't sin. He doesn't ultimately reject God. Ultimately, he chooses to believe that God is faithful even when he feels like God has forsaken him. So this is the way for us, and let's see what that looks like, because this is very hard for us. Even though we know God is faithful, we can feel abandoned by him, and it's often because we're focusing on our circumstances. Psalm 2211, I just put that reference there. You can look at it. It's David saying, there's nobody around to help me, right? And so he's carrying forth this idea of, God, you've forsaken me. I don't feel like I have any help. Where is my help? And then he starts to talk about his circumstances. He says, I feel like there are bulls around me. I don't know if you've ever seen a bull up close. You don't want one bull near you, much less bulls surrounding you. That would be a circumstance of significant danger, right? They are hostile creatures. They don't like you. They don't want to be around you, right? You don't want a bunch of bulls circling you. And David is not saying that he's walking through Jerusalem with a herd of bulls around him, right? He's saying, I feel that way. My circumstances feel like I'm being attacked in this way. And when he's focused on his circumstances, he's also focused on himself. And he says, I feel like I'm poured out like water. And when he focuses on himself and his circumstances, it's not a hard step to also think, and who is out to get me? Who are my enemies? And what are they doing to me? And all of a sudden, all of a sudden, David has lost sight of who God is. And we also, in the same way, lose sight of who God is and how he's been faithful. I said a minute ago that Jesus is going to do this perfectly, right? He's going to hold in balance this feeling of separation and alienation because of the sinful world, because of all of the evil that surrounds us, and also the knowledge that God is faithful. Jesus is going to be able to balance those out and ultimately allow God's faithfulness to rule in his heart and life. But we are going to be tempted, just like Jesus was tempted but one. We are going to be tempted to focus on our circumstances, ourselves, our enemies, anything, really. Because Satan wants to use all of these things. And I said last week, and I'll say again, because our enemies are not flesh and blood. I was a teacher for 10 plus years, administrator for part of that time, and I often had to have a conversation with my teachers saying, the students are not your enemies, And sometimes, as a parent, I've said to other parents, your children are not your enemy. And it's a joke, but it's also a difficult feeling, a reality. Sometimes the people that you are responsible for feel like the ones who are attacking you the most. Sometimes your spouse feels like your enemy. Right? The people that you are supposed to love and be loved by the most feel like your enemies. And when we focus on that, it's almost impossible to see God. And he says, they're not your enemies. He says, the spiritual forces in this world that are opposed to God, they are your enemies, and they will use anybody, your children, your your students, your spouse, they'll use anybody to make you feel like you are completely apart from God. 
But Jesus knows that we cannot keep our focus there. And so he shows us a better way. And he shows us a better way by being the suffering servant. He says, uh, the scripture says, the less we look to God, the more likely we are to sin. The more likely we are to turn away from God. That's all that sin is, right? Sin is not a thing. It's not like uh, there's a substance that is sin. Just by opposing God, we are sinning, right? Doing what is God's will, that's righteousness. And opposing God is sin. And so Jesus, when he comes, he calls people to repent, to turn around. That's what repent means. It means just turn around, go the other way, go toward the Lord instead of away from the Lord. And the more likely we, uh, the more we look to God, um, the more likely we are to not sin. The less we look to God, the more likely we are to sin. And so Jesus is calling us to repent, and he's calling us by saving us and by showing us what it looks like to live as we live but without sin. So continuing in Psalm 22, it says, You, O Lord, don't be far off. You are my help. Come quickly to my aid. Deliver my soul from the sword, my precious life from the power of the dog. Save me from the mouth of the lion. You have rescued me from the horns of the wild oxen. Again, this is David speaking, but it's the Holy Spirit speaking through him because this is what Jesus does for us. He calls out to God. Just as I said last week, don't cry out silently, but share. And so he cries out to God. He says, come quickly to my aid, deliver my soul. Jesus knows this. The Holy Spirit knows we need to hear this. We need to cry out to God. God, you are my Savior. I'm going to recognize you as my Savior. I'm going to depend on you. I said a minute ago that if we're going to have a relationship with Jesus, we have to know who he is. This is who he is. He's the one who saves us, saves our souls. He comes to save us from sin. If we don't sin, we don't need a Savior, but we do. If you've worked with children, you see, right? You see very early on. You do your best as parents. I know you do. To teach them the way that they should go. And they still choose the wrong way. And there is sin in this world that attacks us. Things that we have no part of come and enter our lives and destroy and break down. We need a Savior. And so Jesus comes to save us from sin. And this is what he does. He saves us by suffering with us. Look at what the psalm says here. Psalm 22, 22. I will tell of your name to my brothers in the midst of the congregation. I will praise you. This is David. The tone has changed now. He says, God, I need you to save me. And here's me praising you for saving me. You who fear the Lord, praise him. All you offspring of Jacob, glorify him. Stand in awe of him, all you offspring of Israel. For he, this is Jesus now, David again, prophesying, the Holy Spirit speaking through David. For he has not despised or abhorred the affliction of the afflicted. You guys know what despised means, right? If you despise something, you don't want to look at it. If you despise something, you don't want to be anywhere near it. And David says of the Lord, the Lord has not despised or abhorred the affliction of the afflicted. Certainly David is talking about what God has done for Abraham and Isaac and Jacob. David is talking about what God has done through Moses and through uh, the judges. But David is also talking about Jesus who will come and not only will he not despise the affliction of the afflicted, but he will enter into the affliction of the afflicted. Jesus will suffer just as we suffer. He will take on the same temptations that we are tempted by. This is who Jesus is. I want you to know who he is because I want you to know and have a relationship with this Savior. So here's who Jesus is. He says, I see your sufferings. I'm not going to put myself at arm's length. I'm going to enter into those sufferings with you. He doesn't just do that. He comes to save us by serving us. If you have a Bible and you want to turn with me, uh, turn with me to Isaiah chapter 53. This is also a suffering servant passage. This is also about Jesus. So David writes a thousand years before Jesus, and about 400 years later, Isaiah is writing, so still about 600 years before Jesus, Isaiah is writing, and he says this. I'm going to start in verse uh, chapter 52. Behold, my servant, this is Jesus we're talking about, shall act wisely, and he shall be high and lifted up and shall be exalted. As many were astonished at you, his appearance was so marred beyond human semblance, his form beyond that of the children of mankind. So shall he sprinkle or startle many nations. Kings shall shut their mouths because of him. For that which has not been told them they see, and that which they have not heard they understand. 
This is Jesus, who has believed what he has heard from us, and to whom has the arm of the Lord been revealed? For he, the suffering servant, grew up before the Lord like a young plant, like a root out of dry ground. He had no form or majesty that we should look uh, look to him, and no beauty that we should desire him. He was despised and rejected by men, a man of sorrows, acquainted with grief, as one from whom men hide their faces. He was despised, and we esteemed him not. Surely he has borne our griefs, carried our sorrows, yet we esteemed him stricken, smitten by God, and afflicted. But he was wounded for our transgressions, crushed for our iniquities. Upon him was the chastisement that brought us peace, and with his stripes we are healed. This is Jesus again in Isaiah 53. See the story from David, and now Isaiah, and then we're going to read about it here in a minute in Matthew, all throughout Scripture. Who is this Jesus that we're supposed to have a relationship with? He's someone who suffers our suffering with us. He shares our affliction, and also he comes to serve us. This is from Isaiah 53.10. It was the will of the Lord to crush him. That's Jesus. The Lord has put Jesus to grief. When Christ's soul makes an offering for guilt, he shall see his offspring. He shall prolong his days. The will of the Lord shall prosper in his hand. Out of the anguish of his soul, he shall see and be satisfied by his knowledge By God's knowledge shall the righteous one, my servant, make many to be accounted righteous, and Jesus Christ shall bear their iniquities. That's the primary service that he does for us. He takes our sin. We cannot save ourselves, but he can because he's perfect, because he is God himself. So he says, I will do it. I'll suffer alongside of you, and I will take your sin on myself. And it says there that uh, out of the anguish of his soul, he will see and be satisfied. The New Testament tells us that for the joy that was set before Jesus, he endured the cross. That joy is our salvation. He knew. He looked ahead. He said, I can save them through my sacrifice, and so I will. I'll suffer alongside of them, and I will save them. And that joy is what enables him to endure the cross. And that joy is what enables us to endure our suffering, knowing that Jesus Christ has won. And that he has won not just a victory, but the victory. That he has conquered sin and death. So he comes to save us by suffering for us and with us. He comes to save us by serving us. And he comes to show us ultimately the way. Look at this path throughout all of scripture. If you want to know Jesus, he is throughout scripture showing who he is and what he does. In Psalm 22, in Isaiah 53, and Matthew 27. In Matthew 27, we see that in the circumstances of his crucifixion, Jesus is obedient. David says, I feel like my circumstances are overwhelming, like I'm surrounded like bulls, like there's nothing I can do. And Jesus, in the circumstance of being crucified, is obedient. He's obedient by trusting that God is the faithful father that he says he is. He's obedient, uh, if you read this part of Matthew 27, you see to the point where in the the depiction in Matthew in the gospel, it says Jesus is crucified. That's, That's it. That's the only story we get. He just goes and submits. And he does cry out, as David cries out in Psalm 22, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? I feel like you are so far from me. But he doesn't sin because he ultimately trusts in the Lord. Because of the joy set before him, he endures the cross for our sake. And so, in his circumstances, he's obedient. In his suffering, he serves. Jesus, who is king of the universe, Jesus, who has made all things, uh, Colossians says that in him all things hold together, right? He is before all things, and in him all things hold together. This Jesus, here in Matthew 27, he submits to Pilate, a Roman governor. And Brooks spoke about this uh, many months ago, and he says in this conversation with Pilate and Jesus that Jesus is demonstrating the ultimate act of service here because Pilate says, listen, don't you know I have authority? I could free you. And Jesus doesn't say, "Uh, yeah, please free me. And he doesn't say, you know what? I can rule over you because I'm God and I made you. He simply says, you only have authority because it was given to you. 
And so he acts as a servant just in the way that he's calling us to act as a servant. Because this is not just Jesus doing some interesting stuff. This is Jesus showing us how we can live just as he lived with the same power of the Holy Spirit. So in the presence of his enemies, what does he do? He submits unto death. I know because you're all alive that none of you in this room have submitted unto death. Right? Nobody here has been called to sacrifice their life to the point of death because you're all sitting here. But I don't know if some of you might be called in that way. I do know, though, that Jesus was and he was able to submit himself unto death. And this is the part that's a real struggle for a lot of people who are not believers. They say, how am I supposed to believe that Jesus was the Son of God and that he died and that he rose again? I, how am I supposed to believe that? Where, where's the evidence for that? Where's the proof for that? Well, the proof for that is all of you, if you believe that he is your savior and you live as if he's your savior and you allow him to work in your life and change it. That's the proof. Because this world is sinful. And if he is at work in you, then you will be able to do things, he says, Jesus says, even greater than what he did. Forgiving people for their sins, loving them, serving them, submitting even unto death. This is not something that we do naturally. We don't just give up our lives and let people destroy us naturally. But in hope of everlasting life, we might follow Jesus. And so Jesus says, here's the way. Live as I lived. I lived your life. Now you live mine in me. Here's why we have hope. All the ends of the earth shall remember and turn to the Lord. All the families of the nations shall worship before you, for kingship belongs to the Lord, and he rules over the nations. You all know that there are many rulers in this world, many men and many women who have promised us many things about how they will rule, and all of them fail. Even if they happen to succeed for a little while, their successes will die. All of our successes will die. No matter how hard you work, no matter what you accomplish, no, ma no matter how faithful you are with your gifts, it can only last for this life if it is not in Christ. And yet, and yet we have hope of Christ. We have hope of an everlasting life, of a king who reigns not just here and, and now today in North Liberty, but forever and always over all nations. We have hope of all people. He says, um, everyone bowing down. Even those who can't keep themselves alive, nobody can keep themselves alive, right? Only Jesus Christ. And so posterity will serve him. It shall be told of the Lord to coming generations that they would come and proclaim his righteousness to a people yet unborn, that he has done it. And when it says he has done it, what does it mean? It means he has won, that he has saved our souls, that he has completed his work. We're going to talk uh, today, I'm going to give you this announcement that we have baby dedication class coming up. And we do that because we want to tell those who have just been born, we want to prepare all of you who are about to have children to tell your kids who will be born that Jesus has done it, that he has accomplished this victory. This is where Jesus has generations, where he has prosperity in his day and age, right? In that time, the only real inheritance that you could be sure of were children who would carry on your legacy and your name. It was very important in Jesus' time that you would have children so that they could carry on your name and the work that you've done. Jesus doesn't father any children. Jesus doesn't have any kids. And yet, because of the joy set before him, he laid down his life for us, and now all who have everlasting life are his children. We all have new life in him, Scripture says. And so all of us can bear testimony to him. All of us alive here now, all of those who are about to be born, all of the generations that have ever come, we can tell of his work, what he has done to the future generations, and we can see this suffering servant, and we can see a path forward for ourselves and for them in the midst of hopelessness. And this is difficult, right? The kingdom is is here and it's not yet. It is something that Jesus has done, but yet he's coming back. He says, I'm going to prepare a place for you that where you are, uh, that where I am, that you can be also. And so it's hard, right? Because we don't see him. He is not walking around. But if you cry out to God in the midst of the congregation, if you share what he has done, then his presence will be felt because his Holy Spirit is what empowers that. And so we can look to him, we can see our Savior, and we can cry out knowing he understands, and that will be a testimony. 
every single time, every single one of you cries out to God and you say, God, I need you, you are sharing with all of those around you that you also are partners with them in this journey of suffering. And when you point to Jesus and say, that's my savior, then you are giving testimony to what he has done and you are enabling a community to develop around you. This Jesus, who can be hard to know sometimes, this is what he wants from us, that we would share this together, that we would point to him and see our savior and cry out knowing that he understands, that he did not reject our affliction, but he entered into our affliction. And we also can see his, uh, his path as our own, knowing that he endured. You say, well, yeah, he was God. Of course he endured. It's not hard for God to endure on the cross. But remember that he took on flesh so that he would suffer the way that we have suffered. He does it by the power of his Holy Spirit and then he very clearly at the end of his ministry gives his Holy Spirit to all of us because he says, that's the power you need to do what I've done. So who is this Jesus? He is somebody who suffers like us and he serves us first by giving his life for us and then by giving us his own Holy Spirit so that we can do the same work, even greater works, he says, than he did. Finally, we can see Jesus, we can see our king, and we can worship knowing he reigns. This is what God does. This is what Jesus does. He worships knowing that God ultimately reigns supreme. And it looks different than what we think it's going to look like, always, every time. Because our minds are focused on ourselves, on our circumstances, on our enemies, all kinds of things around us. But Jesus is focused on the truth. He knows what is right and good and true, right? And he is able to separate what is true from just what feels right or good. He's able to do that. It is hard for us to do that. We are tempted all the time to look at things that sound good, that feel good, and to call them true, when they are not in fact. And Jesus knows what is actually true, and he is pointing us to that. Best example for this morning is what we call the triumphal entry. Uh, It is Palm Sunday. Today is the day we typically recognize. And so here I am recognizing to you, this is the day in which Jesus entered into Jerusalem, and many people put down palm branches, and they said, Hosanna, Uh, Hosanna to the son of David. Hosanna to the king, right? This is the guy. We think he is the one. This is what happens to Jesus a week before he's crucified. And why didn't Jesus just let that be his starting point? Why didn't Jesus just start with that, that coming into Jerusalem with all of the celebration and just go on winning and succeeding from there? Why didn't he do that? That's how we would have done it, right? You've got a good base, Jesus. Let's build on this. Right? You've got people singing your praises. Let's take over Jerusalem, and then I think maybe Syria, maybe the Middle East, right? We should start there. But, or I think Rome, maybe in a couple of weeks, we should take over Rome. And then the whole world. That'd be good political strategy for Jesus, right? He says, no, I'm going to die. I'm going to go from triumphal entry to crucifixion because that's what you all need. You all need me to serve you in this way. You need me to suffer like you suffer, because you need to understand that I understand your pain. This is who Jesus is. The man we are supposed to know is the man who chose, he didn't have to, he chose to suffer like we suffer and to serve us by giving his life for us. So who is this Jesus? He's our king. He reigns. Think of the best possible ruler you could imagine That person is nothing because Jesus actually reigns. Remember I said he understands the actual truth, the rock-solid, cling-to-it truth? He reigns, and he endures the cross on our behalf because he knows that he's able to lay down all of this sin before his Father and wipe it away with his sacrifice. He does it. That's what we're supposed to sing praises about, that he has done this, he has accomplished this, he reigns. So don't do this for no reason. Don't do this just blindly hoping. Know that you are hoping for a kingdom which has come but is not yet, which is here but will be here in greater measure when he returns because he is coming back. And he is present here now in your hearts if you will let him, if you will invite him. Pray with me. Heavenly Father, it is hard to know your son when we are focused on ourselves. 
It is hard to know your son when we are focused on just our circumstances or our enemies. But he showed us, Lord Jesus, you showed us what it is like to focus on the Lord, what it is like to follow after him, to remember that he is faithful and has been faithful throughout all generations. Lord, you cried out to God. You suffered as we suffer. Even you, Lord Jesus, felt like your father had abandoned you. But you didn't sin. You held on to the hope that he is faithful and that he will redeem us, that you, Lord Jesus, would redeem us from all of our sins, that you would be able to conquer even death. We praise you for that, Lord. We thank you for that hope, Lord. Help us this week as we anticipate the celebration of your resurrection. Help us to hold on to the hope that we can do this, that we can follow in this path, that we can know you in this way and suffer as you have suffered without sin and serve others as you served others. Lord Jesus, work through us, we pray. In your name, amen.